Praise God. If you have your Bibles, open to the book of Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. And Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Acts chapter 12 and Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Are you glad you came today? Acts chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. In Acts chapter 12, it's going to give the account of Peter who was locked in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Herod has already beheaded James, who was the head of the church at Jerusalem, and it looked like he was going to kill Peter too. But the Bible said that the church prayed for Peter. And an angel came and kicked him, and when he did, he opened the gate, the, he opened the cell door. And then they moved to the gate of the prison, and they, the angel opened that gate. But when they, verse 10, chapter 12, verse 10, and when they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, and it opened to them of its own accord. See, today, to begin this message of welcome home, I want you to understand what City, church, what city Gate Church is, who we are, what is our why. Where did we get that name? Well, in case you wondered where we got the name City Gate Church, it comes from that scripture right there. Because when Peter got to the city gate, the gate to the city, it opened of its own accord. And so theologians call it the miracle gate that led to the city. We want to be that miracle gate that ushers in the presence of God to cities all over this area. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 12. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You've probably seen C3 a lot of places. What's C3? What's C3 mean? That's what C3 means. A threefold cord is not easily broken. We are that threefold cord. And we are stronger together. Will you do me a favor and fist bump somebody next to you and just tell them we're stronger together. We're stronger together. Heavenly Father, God, for the next few moments, open up your word. Let us receive of your Holy Spirit today, I pray. Let us receive your vision for this house because, God, you love this church more than anyone here. And we want to be your church. We want to follow your direction and hear your word and speak your vision to this house and to this city. Make us a miracle gate is my prayer. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. So today we are beginning a new series called Welcome Home. And in welcome you, welcoming you home to City Gate Church, I wanted to take one Sunday and just help you to understand why we do what we do. For those of you that have been here for a while, maybe you understand it, so this will be a refresher course for you. For those of you that this is your first time with us, I want you to understand how seriously we take the vision and the call of God as CityGate Church. Now I would submit to you that one of the most important decisions you'll ever make is what church you're going to call home. So if you don't have a church home, we want to welcome you home to CityGate Church. And I want to welcome everybody watching online today, live or by way of our archives. Will you join with me and welcome our online church this morning? One person is a Christian, but you cannot be a church by yourself. You can be a Christian by yourself, but you can't be a church by yourself. Paul comes along in the book of Hebrews, and he says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. I want you to hear what Paul was saying. Paul has not even lived one generation since Jesus lived, died, resurrected, ascended into heaven, and sent back the Holy Spirit and birthed the church on the day of Pentecost. And yet in just a few short decades, people are already saying the church isn't necessary. 
Let me tell you, staying home from church, missing church, finding reasons not to go to church is not new to this day and age. They were doing it in the days of Paul. And that's the reason he came along and said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. As the men, There were already people in Paul's day saying there's no point in going to church. You can worship God by yourself. That's true. But that's why God gave you a church is so you can worship with people who are like-minded and of a like spirit. So what does it mean to be City Gate Church? Before we go into our fall series, and for those of you that you're new here to City Gate Church and you've not been here through our fall and our winter season, especially this last half of the year, you are in for a ride. We pick up momentum starting in September and we go all the way till January when we celebrate the new year. So we have got some big series coming up. First off, we've got our Welcome Home series, which we're starting today in October. We're going to begin our 321 Eternity series where we have seen over 250 people give their hearts to Jesus Christ in just three weeks. Three weeks, 250 people get saved. So here's what I tell people. If you bring them, God will save them. But you've got to bring them. And then after that, we go into our Thanksgiving series. And then we're all ready to Christmas. My goodness. How many's got your Christmas shopping done? I hope you bought me something nice. So before we go into the fall series, I thought it would be a good time to clearly articulate our why and the values of CityGate Church. For those of you that are members here, I want you to know what you're a member of. For those of you that are, you are new here, I want you to know what you're getting into. Today we're going to establish our eight gates. You have probably seen these eight gates in your experience. If, if you have them in your experience, just draw a line through some of them because we even changed that recently. I met with the staff this week and I set them down and I said, on Sunday I'm going to preach about the eight gates to our city. And when I do, this will be a foundation upon which we will build God's church. We will live and we will die by these values, by these principles. We're not going to sway, but we will stand for these principles and values as a church. And I said, so before I get up and preach them, and they are written in stone until someday in the future, God may want to add to it, God may want to adjust or change something, but for now these are going to be written in stone. So let's know that these are the values of City Gate Church. And we begin to rework some things, combine some things, add some new things that we thought and we believe as the values as we prayed. These are the values of City Gate Church. So we're going to establish our eight gates this morning. Now as I was thinking about this, I didn't even realize that when we got eight gates, that there's eight letters in City Gate. For those of you that are Perry Stone fans, you'll shout on that part right there. because that, That's some numbers, you know, eight goes in the city, whatever. I thought it was neat. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to define what these eight gates look like, and then we're going to clarify how we accomplish it. So I want you to hear these eight gates because this is the heart of this house, and this is the foundation upon which we will build. These are the eight gates to this city. Our first gate is we love people. Here's what this looks like. No matter what, we love you, period. We don't have to qualify it. We don't have to explain it. We don't have to define it. We love you, period. Wherever you're from, whatever you've done, whatever race, whatever nationality, whatever uh, 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 economic status, however much schooling you had, if you're a high school dropout or if you're a college professor, we love you. In fact, I want you to look at somebody and say, I love you. See, here's what we believe. We believe that when people finally feel the love of God, they won't struggle with inferiority and they won't worry about what anybody else thinks. I've heard it said that a child gets confidence when they know they have the love of their father. Well, you may not have had an earthly father, but you have a heavenly father who loves you, unconditionally loves you overwhelmingly loves you and that ought to take away any inferiority that you have and it ought to take away your worry about what anybody else thinks. See, we need to get past the idea that people have something to prove just to come to church. 
Now look, if you're going to come to our church, let me, hold on, let me tell you how we dress here. Because you can't wear that to our church. The devil is a liar. Look, if you've been hanging around here for a while, you know how we dress. But I'm sure not going to tell sinners how to dress before they get into the bathtub to get washed and cleaned, and cleaned, cleaned up. The Holy Spirit does that work. We need to get rid of that idea that they have something to prove just to come to church. And listen, great preaching without love is just noise in God's view. I believe one of the reasons that the preaching is powerful in this place is not because of me. It's because of the love of God that he has put in me towards you. When I preach, I preach out of love. Now sometimes as a father I have to discipline, but I do it in love. We love all people. Now that's a big statement because not everybody's easy to love. Can I get a good amen on that? I heard about a church, they were about 75, 80 people. And in the middle of the church service, the devil showed up and stood on the platform. And he said, the devil said, if you're not scared of me, stay in your seats. The whole church jumped up and ran out the back door. Some people jumped out of the windows. Except for one old deacon on the front row. And the devil looked at him and he said, Man, do you know who I am? He said, I know who you are. No, do you really know who I am? He said, yeah, you're the devil. I know who you are. He said, and you're not scared of me? He said, devil, I've been married to your sister for the last 35 years. No, I ain't scared of you. even those who are difficult to love. You know what I learned about Jesus? Jesus didn't just love the lovable. He loved the unlovable. Get him a crook of a tax collector, he'll love him. Let them drag a prostitute into the street to stone her, he'll love her. He loves the unlovable. Now let me give you some scripture. John chapter 15 verse 12. Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. John 13, 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I has loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, Paul said, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. 1 Peter 1, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. You know what? God doesn't want us just to love those that are in the church. He wants us to love those outside of the church. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. In this love of God, in this the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Most importantly, because we love people, we're going to tell them about Jesus Christ. See, Jesus preached on hell more than any other preacher in the Bible. Do you know why he told us about it? Because he didn't want us to go there. He said, at my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. What was he saying? I want you to go to heaven for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you, wants you to go to heaven. If we love people with the same love that Jesus Christ loved them with, then we're going to tell them about Jesus. Here's another gate to our city. 
We are Christ-centered. Christ-centered. Here's what that looks like. It's all about Jesus. All of our worship, all of our message, and our ministry is focused on Him. In other words, it starts with Jesus. It ends with Jesus. He's in the center of it all. It's all about Jesus. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. We are not a church that's just going to talk about God. Because the world don't have a problem when you talk about God. They're cool when you say, I want to thank God for this award that I won for cussing on a rap album. They don't care when you talk about God, but don't you dare mention the name of Jesus. Well, in this church, we're all about Jesus in here. Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and we move and we have our being. Everything that Paul did in his ministry, he did it for Jesus. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Everything we do, we do it through the power of Jesus Christ. He is, number one, the target of our affection. We are here for Him. We were created for Him. For His pleasure was every person in this room created. There are no accidents in the church. You were created for the pleasure of Jesus Christ. So our target, He is the target of our affection. He is the purpose of our preaching. Paul came along and said in one scripture, he said, and if Jesus had not risen from the grave, then our preaching is futile and you are dead in your trespasses. The only thing that gives power to our preaching is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And finally, he is the motivation of our ministry. You know, a lot of people start off as servants and they quickly end up as church celebrities. You know any of these folks? But those of us who understand the vision don't have to be pumped and primed to serve Jesus. See, we know what Jesus did for us. And it's an honor for us to serve Jesus in his house so that others might come to know him. So here's how it looks. We worship Jesus. We serve Jesus. We preach Jesus. We give for Jesus. And we are going to live for Jesus. Another gate to our city, creative. We are creative. Here's what this looks like. It's kind of fun to do the impossible. Nobody, or let me say this, the Bible never said church had to be boring. You know, who told you you had to be bored when you went to church? The church should be the most creative place on the planet. We should be leading the way. In cre- Something happened. To my- oh, I forgot about that. That's, that's some of our creativity around here. See, here's when we get into a meeting, when we get into a planning session, and we start planning out moments like this and sermons like this, do you know what we ask ourselves? How do we make the message sticky? We want to make the messages sticky in this house. In other words, when you leave here, we want the message to stick to you in a way that you can't get it off. So when you go swimming and a big beach ball comes flying out, you're like, hold on. Pastor said, take the limits off, and a beach ball came flying out. We want to make the message sticky. When you turn a snow globe upside down, we want you to be reminded of what it was like for Joseph and Mary when their world got turned upside down at the birth of Jesus. We want the message to be sticky. Now, God... That's called that. That's my shout. That's my church dance right there. All we do is jump rope. White folks, if you don't know how to dance, just jump rope. That's all we have to do. Just wait for it. Church beat comes on. Just you're good. This is a place for creative ideas. This is a place for dreams. 
In other words, we want to saturate this place in creativity so that when you come in here, you dream the impossible and then you go out and do it. That's what we want. Another gate to our city, we are committed to excellence. That's a scary word for a lot of people. We are committed to excellence. Here's what that looks like. Excellence honors God and inspires people. It is our signature on all that we do. Everything we do here at City Gate Church, we want to autograph it with excellence. Because we know that excellence is honoring God and it is inspiring people. Now many churches have set their bar so high, striving for ministry perfection, that they can't find volunteers to step up and sign up. Our growth at CityGate has happened because we hold to a good enough principle, which allows for more people to get involved. In other words, it doesn't have to be perfect for God to bless it. At CityGate, we would rather involve a lot of regular folks in ministry than have a perfect church ran by a few elite people. We want to be a model for other churches. We want other churches to see what you can do when, when you don't have to go out and hire the top professionals in the land. But you can use just an average, seemingly ordinary person. But when they submit themselves to God, God will do the extraordinary through them. See, there's a big difference, and here's what I want you to hear. There is a big difference between perfection and excellence. We call a lot of times excellence, but what we really believe is perfection. Let me explain this. Perfection is my definition of excellence. You must find a way to produce perfection for it to truly be excellent. But here's the deal. Perfection is for us, not for God. Perfection is when we run around and set standards for how things have to be. And then we get upset when people don't live according to our standards. You didn't do it the way I wanted. You didn't look the way I wanted. You didn't sing the way I wanted. That's perfection. But excellence is God's definition of perfection. See, God says, give me your best. The best you can give, that's excellence. And when you do your best, I'll make it perfect. There is nothing perfect on this planet except for the Word of God. Nothing perfect on this planet except for the Word of God. And I want to invite up here just for a moment an incredible man. His name is Reuben, and he is a man of excellence. And we are so thankful that God brought him and his wife, Everlyn, to City Gate Church. And I've asked him to come up here and share a little bit of his story and what God's done in his life since he's been at City Gate Church. This is a man of excellence. Give him a big God bless you this morning. Good morning, City Gate. Uh, I've been in church all of my life. Uh, Grew up from a child and just all the way through. But I I really wasn't saved until uh, 1998. We moved here, and uh, I stayed in church. But the last few years, Pastor preached a message last week about uh, on the other side of the road. But I was dying spiritually. I really was. I, I, I uh, was dying spiritually. And a good friend of mine, Jesse, told me about Town Worship Center that is now City Gate. And I came, and it changed my life. It, it changed my life in a whole lot of ways. But the first time we went to the Savannah Center, they asked for volunteers. And... Uh, I said, yes, I'll volunteer uh, to be part of the, the setup and teardown crew. I, I used to be a professional mover, so I knew I could do some things like that. But uh, it required somebody who was going to be on time, who was going to be here at the start, who would be here at the end. And so that's who I am. If, when I commit to something, I'm in it all the way. And so I, I committed to be part of, of, of the crew, and uh, I'm still a part of it. And I, uh, the only time I've missed is when I was on vacation or out of town. But uh, Pastor also mentioned last week about being burned. I got burned once while I was here. Uh, I went home that day. I was really troubled. And the old me that was dying would have said, that's it. I, 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 I won't take that on the job. It's what they pay me to do. But you know what? 
the next week I was right back here. I was right back here. I was back here That's awesome. because I, I'm committed. I, I'm in it all the way, and I encourage you to come, come and join us, and whether it's the crew or any other volunteer service that you can do. We want you to come in and be a part of it because, like me, it'll change your life. But a, a quick story. Uh, I work for a corporation. I'm in a leadership role, and um, I get paid. I get compensated based upon performance. It's called a performance incentive. And we call it a bonus, if you will, in addition to my, my normal pay. But uh, let's see, the year before last, I had traveled to about 150 locations. I was gone all the time, even on Sunday, you name it. But uh, one of my goals, I had four goals. Three of them I controlled directly. Uh, one of them was based upon the performance of the corporation. One of them required me to travel even more. And... That year, I said, I'm going to go the second half of the year because uh, I've traveled so much, I just want to spend some time at home. In October, my mother turned ill, and I had to travel to Alabama, just back and back and forth. And that's a long story, I, hopefully I'll tell someday. But I told my boss, I'm going to miss that one goal because I have traveled so much that I just, I just can't travel anymore. But on my incentive, I had those three goals that I'm responsible for. One of them was one-third of my entire incentive bonus, one-third. Pastor preached an unusual series of messages, unusual. And he gave us the opportunity during that series to give an unusual offering, okay? And he asked those who were going to give this certain amount to stand. My wife and I quickly stood up because we knew we were going to invest in that because we know the power of God. So we gave the end of the year time came for me to report on my incentives, one of them I knew I, I had missed. I didn't even attempt to do it because I was just traveling too much. Came time for the bonus. I went into our compensation plan. I looked to see what my bonus was going to be. To my huge surprise, but yet not surprise, it was far greater than what I was expecting. Yeah. Far greater. In fact, it was so much greater. That, remember I said I controlled three of them. One of them was one-third of the entire bonus. The amount that we gave in the unusual giving, this particular amount of increase over and above what I was expecting was more than ten times what we gave in that unusual <laughs> offer. More than ten times. So let me close with this. Pastor, I see the vision. I get the mission. You're leading us somewhere. I'm on board this spiritual train, and I got you back all the way. Yes, sir. Love you, Give Reuben White a big God bless you. He's a man of excellence. At City Gate, we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for excellence. You just do your best, and God will make up the rest. And that leads me to the next gate to our city, Generous. We are a generous church. Here's what it looks like. Generosity is a lifestyle. We freely give of our time, our talent, and our treasure. We realize that all that we have, our life, our breath, our job, our homes, our cars, everything that we have, it's all His. He gave it to us. And if He asks us for it, we're ready to bring it. I want you to nudge somebody and tell them, bring it. Now say it with a little bit of an attitude. Say, bring it. <laughs> See, here's what I want to tell you. When we bring it, he blesses it. When we bring it, he blesses it. Whatever you bring, he blesses and multiplies. The Bible tells us that whenever we give to and through the local church, we are literally giving it to Jesus Christ. And when he receives it, he blesses it. And when you give, when you give of your time, when you give of your talent, when you give of your treasure, your reach is multiplied greatly. As part of God's house, your reach can be multiplied. Now you may be asking, Pastor, how can one single person make a difference? Well, Far Farmer's Almanac, I don't want you to get depressed when I say this. Farmer's Almanac, they say, is right 80% of the time. And it is calling for the coldest, snowiest winter in 29 years this year. 
Now let me ask you something. Is there anybody in this room that's afraid of a snowflake? No. But if you can get enough snowflakes together, you can knock power out. You can stop schools and stop cars from being able to drive on the road. That's what happens when one person decides to stick together with somebody else. You may just be an individual in this room, but you are sticking to a lot of other people. And God's making us an amp avalanche that we're going to wreck this city for Jesus Christ. So when we bring it, he blesses it. But there's another part. When we bring it, tell somebody, bring it. Hit somebody in front of you that's not expecting it. I'm, I'm kidding. When we bring it, he blesses us. Giving to God's house unleashes heaven's blessings on us. At the end of this month, we are going to challenge everybody in this room, every single person in this room, to take part in our 90-day challenge. Non-tithers and tithers alike. Here's the way this works. If you have never tithed before, biblically tithed before, we are going to challenge you to tithe biblically for 90 days. And you can read all about it on the church website. Biblically tithe for 90 days. Take the challenge. And we believe that God is going to bless you in some way in your, in your life in those 90 days as a result of your faithfulness to what his word says. As part of the 90-day challenge for our non-tithers in the room, if God does not bless you, at the end of 90 days, we will write you a check and give you all your money back. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That's how much confidence we have in the word of God. Because that the only place that God says, test me, is in the tithing. And he said, see if I will not open up windows in heaven and pour you out a blessing. You won't have room enough to receive it. Now, what about our tithers, our people that are faithful tithers? We're going to ask you over them 90 days to take a significant step of faith and give over and above your tithes. Do something that takes faith and believe that God is going to move and bless your life. This is going to be a moment of spiritual growth for some. This will be a huge step of faith for others. In doing this, we're asking everybody in the room for these next few weeks leading up to the last Sunday in September. That will be the first day of giving. And that will lead us to 90 days of giving to the end of the year. We are asking you to join us in fasting one day a week until Commitment Day, September 28th. And that will be our first week of giving. Well, Pastor, I don't get paid every week. Look, you give as God increases you. Okay? Let's not get technical on it. You give as God increases you. If you get paid once a month, you give when you get paid once a month. If you get paid biweekly, you give when you get paid biweekly. But I ask everybody to fast with us one day a week leading up to September 28th. Here's another gate to our city. We are authentic. Here's what this looks like. Be yourself. We're going to. I like that. Be yourself. That's what we're going to do. We're not putting on a show for anybody. Be yourself. If you try to live your life that wins the approval of others, you will always be under stress, you will manipulate people, and be scared of being discovered. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul has nothing to hide. Listen to what he says. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man conscience in the sight of God. In other words, here's who we are. Our blemishes, our weaknesses, our failures. Here we are. That's what I want to tell somebody. You don't have to be perfect for God to use you. But you do have to be honest. Everybody, almost everybody, I would say most people who listen to what I say, know my weaknesses here at City Gate Church. You know why? Because I tell you, I don't hide my weaknesses. You need to know my weaknesses. Because while you can grow from watching people's strengths, you will fa grow far faster and greater by learning about their weaknesses. 
So I want you to know, see, having obvious imperfections in a pastor is a good thing. I want you to know that I'm not perfect. I'm striving for excellence. And God is blessing. He, where I am weak, he is making me strong. You have to decide whether or not you want to impress people or influence people. At CityGate Church, do you want to impress people or do you want to influence people? Here's the difference. I can impress you being far away. Have you ever seen one of them Facebook pictures? You know how Facebook puts that little bitty square? And you're like, man, that's a, you know, they're pretty. That's a good looking person. And then you click on that picture and it blows up. And you're like, goo. You're pretty from far, but up close, far from pretty. You know what I'm talking about? Just being authentic with you. See, when, when you impress people and when you live to impress people, you do it from afar. They only see a little bit of who you are. But if you want to influence people, you have to get up close. And when you get up close... They're going to see all the zits on your face. I'm not afraid of showing my zits. Because I'm not living to impress you. I want to influence you. And in order to influence you, I'm going to have to get close to you. And by getting close to you, it's going to expose some of the weaknesses in my life. When you are not authentic, it only gets worse for you. It gets diff more difficult to live life. I don't want to live life as a fake and a fraud. I want to live authentic. Here's another gate to our city. Thrive. Everybody say thrive. Here's what thrive looks like. We thrive. We take the limits off. We dare to believe God for the unusual. We weren't made to survive. We were created to thrive. Mark 11, 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. What am I talking about? Have faith. Oh, you already forgot. Have faith. I believe I will. I take it. I have it. It's mine. Thank you. I forget. Have faith. One more time. Have faith. I believe I will. I take it. I have it. It's mine. Thank you. I forgive. Now that doesn't sound like somebody that's just trying to survive. That sounds like somebody who's ready to thrive. Abundant life is what we're talking about. Anything is possible. We want to be a thriving church. We don't want to be a titanic church. Just trying to keep the boat afloat. Even rats know to abandon a sinking ship. We want to be a church that thrives. 3,000 mosques are built a year in this country. 3,800 evangelical churches are built a year. Now that sounds good. It sounds like we're winning by 800. Until you see that 2,200 evangelical churches shut down every year. 80% of the mosques in this country were built in the last 12 years. 50% of evangelical churches will not see one convert this year. 50%. The Assembly of God said that 80% of born-again people, born-again believers happen in churches that are two years old and under. 80%. There are in America... 195 million unchurched people. When I say unchurched, I mean they've never been through the door of a church before. 109. I was getting coffee today at Speedway. Thank you, Lord, for Speedway coffee. If you have never had Speedway, get that mocha charge. It's got like 15 times the caffeine in it. 
you hit that button, just smelling it's waking you up. You're like, <laughs> and it's a dollar sixty, folks. You're paying ten dollars for a pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks. I got a gallon of coffee this morning for a dollar sixty at Speedway, and a giant pizza roll. There are people that have never been in a church before, and I was getting coffee, and I looked around, and I saw all these nice-looking people just getting ready to go live their day and had no thought of the house of God in their mind. And I went, God, they're all around us. Growth is all around us. The average church in America is running 75 people today. 75 people. 350, if your church is running over 350 people on a Sunday, you are in the top 10% of churches in America. Think about that. 85% of churches in America are declining. Their numbers are going down. Well, at CityGate Church, we don't operate with the survival mentality. We don't make decisions based on the survival of our church. We follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God because we are going to, th to thrive while other people are just trying to survive. And can I tell you something? The churches and churches all around this area, we are not on some addition of survivor with these other churches that we're hoping they get voted off the island before we do. We're hoping they shut their doors before we do. I passed no less than 12 churches on my way to this church this morning. And you know what I did, everyone? I went by. I reached my hand out and I said, God, fill every seat in their house. Let souls be saved in their churches today. Baptize people with the Holy Ghost. Let them feel your love. God, fill their parking lot. Fill their pews. Fill their chairs. I'm not in a competition with other churches. I want every church to thrive. We got 195 million people lost. There ain't nobody's church seating 195 million people. We all got room for the lost. Praise God. We want every church to succeed. We want every church to thrive. And that brings me to my last gate. You guys can come to the music. This is the last gate, the eighth gate of City Gate Church. We worship. I want you to tell somebody we worship around here. Now, I've given you a short definition of each one of these gates. This is the only one that has a disclaimer. True worship happens when we put our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the Lord in response to who He is and what He has done. Let me say that again. True worship happens when we put our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the Lord in response to who He is and what He's done. Here is the disclaimer. Caution. It may get radical. We're going to sing. We're going to shout. We're going to run. We're going to dance. We're going to jump. We're going to clap. And we may slap a few people before the service is over. But we are not about boring, lifeless, somebody go grab the defibrillator worship. David said in the word of God, the dead don't praise the Lord. What makes you think somebody's dead when they stop moving? Don't think you're going to be able to sit there and not move during one of our worship experiences here at City Gate Church. We are not going to have a worship service that is boring and lifeless, that we have to resuscitate the chosen frozen every time we come together. We are coming in this place ready to worship God. Do I have any worshipers in the house? Come on, do I have anybody that just loves abandoned worship, overflow worship, pour out all my love on Jesus worship?
Be seated for a moment. That's the service. That's our service. But real worship goes even deeper. Colossians chapter 3 verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. See, around here we believe our serving is worship. We believe that those people that were waving at you in the parking lot as you came in today, that they were worshiping God as they was waving you into your parking spot. We believe that whoever heated up the coffee and whoever brewed the coffee this morning, they were worshiping God back there brewing coffee. We believe that the teachers, I went down and greeted all of our teachers this morning in Kids Town. We believe that every one of those teachers right now is worshiping God by teaching your children about God. Those who smiled and greeted you at the door as you came in. Those who received your offering. Those who handed you information. You know what they were doing? They were worshiping God. If you just sit here and never participate, you've never truly worshiped God. If you're just showing up, you'll never experience the full benefit that God has to offer. And that's why I want to take a moment. And I want to say to all of our volunteers, if you're a volunteer in some area in the church, raise your hand. Raise your hand up. I want you to look around. Look at that. Look at that. I want to say to all of our volunteers, thank you for worshiping. Thank you for worshiping God. When you pick up your child today, I dare you to tell one of the workers in Kids Town, one of the leaders or the teachers in Kids Town, I dare you to tell them thank you for worshiping. I dare you to find a leader. Go back to the Welcome Center. Find our Life Cafe. Find somebody and say, how do I worship God in this church? I want to serve. I want to get involved. I want to park cars. I want to greet people at the door. I want to serve in Kids Town. How can I get involved? See, we believe our serving is worship. We also believe our giving is worship. Do you know we don't think that giving is just a way to pay the bills? We believe that when we give, we are worshiping God with our giving. And finally, we worship God with our lives. We believe the way we live outside of the church is worship unto the Lord. Everybody can put on their good church outfit on Sundays. But what do you wear on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday? See, the way you live, the way you talk, the way you act with other people, the way you act around other people, the way you conduct business is worship unto God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. My life is worship to God. Stand with me all over this congregation. These are the gates to City Gate Church. Now, if I would be honest with you, if I'd be authentic with you, I would tell you that I'm not even 100% where I need to be in fulfilling these eight gates. There are some gates that I'm still growing. There are some gates that God's still working on me. But now I've got a target. I've got a focus. And I know what I'm trying to achieve. That is the vision. And there may be some of you that saw some of these gates up here on the screen. And you said, I, I struggle with that one. I don't love everybody. Jesus is not the center of everything that I do. I'm not serving. I'm not giving. I'm not a generous person. I'm not authentic. I come to church every Sunday and I wear a mask. I don't let people see who I really am. Maybe you need to pray right now. God, help me be fulfill one of those gates to this city. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to pray, God, in whatever every gate, in whatever gate you are struggling with or weak in or falling short of, I want you to pray that God would give you a special anointing to stand at that gate and open that gate to this city. Pray. This is between you and God right now. We're going to pray corporately in just a moment, but I want you to pray right now. Pray, God. Where are you weak? Where are you weak? What gate was difficult for you? Pray that God would give you the strength to open that gate, to love people, to be Christ-centered, to worship with abandonment. 
to be a generous person, to live an authentic life, to sign the signature of excellence in all that I do. This is what I want to see from my life. God, I want to be creative. You are a creator and you have created us in your image and likeness. And I want to be creative as you are creative, God. Whatever area we are weak in, God, strengthen that gate. Because we are only as strong as our weakest gate. We want this to be the foundation and vision of everything that we do here at City Gate Church. These are the gates, the vision, the values that are going to lead to the city of City Gate Church. This is going to make up who we are, what we do, and what we are about, God. We want to clearly identify it to the world why we are City Gate Church. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.